This is GEA Embedded here on Ball Study, where every Monday throughout the GEA Championships, we're here with the best analysis. We'll talk to Darren O'Sullivan in just a couple of minutes as his carry crashed out of the championship. Tyrone and Maya will be the All-Ireland final. A big surprise for an awful lot of people. I don't think everybody in Tyrone would agree. We'll talk to Darren about that in a second. Loads more in the show as well, too. We'll uh, speak to Morris Brosnan about some of the TV coverage around the game, uh, be it the Sunday game or the live game on Saturday, and exactly what we're getting out of that and who it's serving. It's an uh, interesting discussion that we can have with both of us having very strong opinions on it. And Finchie is back with another great video for us, this time looking at some of the best losing performances from individuals on uh in gea history so a uh, class list to get into there but it's time to get to darren o'sullivan because kerry have been knocked out of the championship and Tyrone are in another all Ireland final darren Nick, how are you doing uh yeah look we, we'll, tr we'll try to keep this a little bit unbiased and make it a, 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 as as um as as general a conversation as possible but you're in a pub uh a uh, look fantastic i'm sure people in there on sunday trying to forget it uh the day after the match or even saturday night what's the reaction been down there what have people been talking about in uh in in the in your experience in the kingdom since uh since saturday evening um i think it's just disappointment in the performance really um if you break it down Kerry had enough of the ball they had enough opportunities to win the game um and the surprising thing from a Kerry point of view is the decision making was just so poor on the day. And um, especially with the structure of the game now, you know, you have your water breaks. So you have opportunities to rectify what's going wrong. And Kerry didn't do it. They failed to do it or, or the management failed to see it. Um, so I think the disappointing thing is so many players underperformed. And then a lot of players, they, they made the same mistakes over and over again so look take nothing away from it the better team won mm. harry can have no complaints and they have themselves to blame really far going out of the championship yeah i suppose that comes to kerry we're looking at it, saying them they have themselves to blame to rome will look at it and saying it was a game plan perfectly mm. orchestrated and, and and delivered um when it comes to Tyrone, right so it's funny, you're going to talk to Morris later on about some of the TV coverage and about maybe it can be simplistic about hunger and intensity versus the actual analysis of what happened. But I do think it can feed into each other a little bit, you know, and it did seem like Tyrone came out. You saw Sean Cavanaugh straight away on TV. You're going, oh, this is this is the internal line here is chip on the shoulder. People have been unfair to us. People have been out to get us. That's obviously going to feed into the group. It's going to feed into the management and you saw it even first 10 15 minutes thrown are like everywhere they're just like you know <laughs> like flies on shit is the only thing i can think of you know and, and that is hard to adapt to if you're not expecting it and that can be an indictment to kerry as well i'm not suggesting that they shouldn't have been ready but perhaps that they weren't like there of kerry they should have expected it yeah they might be used to it yeah because they paid nothing up to now but you should expect that and that that was a disappointing like tyrone didn't bring anything that we weren't expecting we all know what tyrone bring they bring this manic aggression it's borderline no that's all it is it's borderline they go to the edge nothing wrong with that mm. kerry should have expected it um and crow park is a pitch where you can avoid it crow park's a big pitch you stay wide and you kick you avoid the tackles and twos and trees kerry didn't do that kerry made the pitch narrow and they ran into traffic. Um, now Tyrone got their tactics right, but we knew everybody knew what Tyrone were going to bring. Kerry knew what Tyrone were going to bring, and just didn't adapt. Yeah. Why though? Because <laughs> I think even their narrowness was in defence as well. You saw a lot of Tyrone scores <laughs> came from just having that overlap of nobody going with a man. Hampsey's point I can specifically remember out of the right hand side came from exactly that you know they were narrow all the way through that point the one you're on about that comes from Connor Myler standing yeah. at Kerry forward up and just walking around him and the Kerry forward jogged after him it was just it was shocking um for me that was the worst score of the game you see two players going eye to eye and one fella just waltzes around him and the other fella watches him um and then there was a runner so like at times that you the, the backs get the blame but that was a forwards issue like you 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 start your defense from number 15. kerry didn't do that yesterday they didn't work hard enough and if you look at it i actually taught the full back line and the kerry backs get a lot of abuse and 
you know, we we picked on them in the show. I said they weren't good enough, and they always seem to get the blame. And I thought they were playing quite well at times yesterday, man on man. But then we left runners go, and it's very hard to keep an eye on one man and see these runners coming from everywhere. So I had a bit of sympathy for them yesterday. I thought for long periods, like Darren McCurry has been one of the top forwards in the country this year. He was very quiet. I think he got his first point from playing the 55th minute. Tom Sullivan was doing an excellent job on him. And like it all came, a lot of the scores, even the goals from runners coming from deep, which is a forwards issue that they weren't tracking. They weren't working as hard as the Tyrone players. So again, wh why? Like, I, I, you know, and I, again, it's, it's like we know what Tyrone are going to bring, even if it's like, even if it's, if it's a hyped up intensity to more than you expect at Grand, but we know the style that they're going to play. As Tommaso Shea said last night, they're going to, they're going to do it. They've been doing it for 10 years or so. M. Fitzmaurice in his examiner column today is saying like the players need to take a responsibility for this and not mm -hmm. hide behind the manager. The manager will probably change after this until someone new come in. But if they don't learn their personal lessons from what they did wrong, Kerry can't take that next step. Would you agree that this was a kind of a collective responsibility of they didn't do the job they needed to do on the day? 100%. Like it can't always be the manager's fault. No, I do think the management got it wrong. I do think they got some of their changes wrong, um, personnel probably wrong, um, but the players themselves didn't perform. Some of them didn't work hard enough in certain periods of the game. They left fellas go. It was highlighted on the Sunday game. They showed points where Kerry left runners go. You never saw a Tyrone fella leave a runner go. If anything, you saw two Tyrone fellas. Tyrone sensed the danger. You, once Kerry were in a certain area and there was danger, it was red flag. And you've seen Tyrone lads running with everything they had to put a hand on him, be in their eye line, get in the way. Kerry didn't have that. Kerry didn't sense the danger or they were too preoccupied with minding their own house. Hmm. Where does it, like, I'm just trying to fit, put my place. Uh, there's a the Paul Caney clip that they showed on the Sunday game last night. It's just one of many. But mm -hmm. like, uh, there was a point to me, there was a part of me that's just thinking, like, that's a tough job to go every single time with them when, when they are running like that. If that's not drilled into you, if that's not, and I'm not making excuses, but if that's not drilled into you, if that's not something that you're doing every day in training or in every match, because let's face it, Kerry don't have to do that in every match. It's a very hard thing to just suddenly do in the in a random play in the seventeenth minute of the first half, you know, like. But that's, that's that is something you have to do in every game. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a first round of Munster Championship or an All Ireland semi final. You're told if your man goes, go. If a runner goes and you're beside him, he's your man. You get him. Like I always remember in the dressing room before. And I remember it was it was Declan Sullivan said it before he goes to know about Twitter and Instagram, liking tweets and all. He goes, that's not somebody you're going to, like he was on about when you retire, he goes, I remember the fellow who bailed me out in the field, who tracked my man, not the fellow who likes and retweets my stuff. So there were times yesterday where a man went, and it might have been the designated players, man, but they went. And if he's nearest you, you go with him. You bail out your buddy and he'll bail you out the next time. But fellas didn't do that. And that's a knock on effect. Do you know, if a fella sees if he gets caught out of position and his man goes up up the field and one of your teammates sees him and leaves him off, you're going to be less inclined to burst your ass to cover for him the next time. And that happened from very early days. And the surprising thing and the disappointing thing is that's not the players that I know and the Kerry supporters would know. Mm. They looked like they were lacking energy yesterday. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was because they weren't used to that intensity of games. It very well could be that five weeks without a game. The Munster Championship, we've said, weren't games. The league games this year were glorified challenge games. No, that's not Tyrone's fault. Um, you could say it's not Kerry's fault. But they, it might have been Tyrone's fault when they went down to Killarney, but other than that... <laughs> yeah, they that game. They gave a nice false sense of security there. But like a lot of it's basics. Tyrone, they did a, a work carry. They made better decisions, um, but at the same time, like you're, you're, I keep looking at it. Kerry had a lot of the ball. David Moore dominated midfield. They had the opportunities. Yeah. Their decision making was wrong. Um, they had a chance to regroup at the water break. They had another chance to regroup at halftime, and then they had another water break to say, 
lads, you need to put, if you're coming in from an angle, put it over the bar. The goal isn't always on. Keep mm -hmm. the scoreboard tipping over. Tyrone did that. Kerry didn't. Yeah, it's it, it's it like people will think this is probably a little bit Kerry centric. It is understandable when you score, when you lose by a point in extra time, and you know where it didn't go well and where they didn't play well. That you do have to talk about it from Kerry's point of view, trying away. But from Tyrone's point of view, they did everything they were supposed to do. Some of that defending that did close out those goal chances was very very good, and they did everything right. I would say in, in what they were trying to do. Just wondering, we'll talk about the final later on, but like. How good do you think this Tyrone team is? They came through a very difficult Ulster Championship. They, obviously, everything that's happened in the last few weeks, we kind of forgotten about them as an, as an entity. Everything was about their situation rather than their team. And then you see, like, this is, they're in not Ireland final with a 50-50 chance, you'd say now. Like, you know, that this is a team we, it's a, it's a, what's the way I'm looking to put it? It's a very, very, um, it's the right kind of successor for the teams of the 2000s, isn't it? It feels very like them. It has that same kind of character, same style, and same good footballers as well, which they, that the was what the last bit might have been what they've been missing in the last kind of seven or eight years. Well, I don't know what they're missing the good footballers, but maybe the style of play, maybe they were too too concentrating on the defensive side of things. Yesterday, they, they seem to be getting the balance right all along. Their forward play this year has been excellent. They Like the Ulster Championship team, we've all said it, that the Ulster Championship this year was brilliant. It was high score and it was attacking. The defending was maybe not where we'd expect it normally. Tyrone seemed to be getting that balance right. Yesterday, they had it perfect, or Sunday they had it per Saturday, they had it perfect. Their attacking game was brilliant. They kicked into space. They... Um, they counterattacked with runners and then defensively they were man on man but they sensed danger they never left anyone isolated but very rarely they they seem to be getting that balance right between defense and attack um and we probably did overlook them not Kerry I'm saying about everyone in Ireland like could people talk about Dublin they talked about Kerry look maybe we are getting overhyped with playing nothing down in Munster the league league and championship two different sports really um maybe the Kerry lads were listening too much to the hype maybe the supporters were listening too much to the hype um but tyrone got the balance right yesterday like the matchups were brilliant mcgeary and connor myler were exceptional mm -hmm. like their fitness levels on top of everything else very good footballers dogged tenacious they were up to feel not only did they mark their men but they gave him something to think about going the opposite way. Like how many of the, the full back line were scoring? Like it, the fact that so many of the Tyrone defenders scored, you're like going, that's that's more evidence that Kerry didn't work hard enough or they didn't track the runners. Um it just like it's it was so like trying to take off my Kerry hat, but it was just so such a disappointing Kerry performance by yeah. so many. Um like you can go through the team. I thought Tom Sullivan had a very good fifty five minutes. Mm. And later on, when you want him or Curry to step up, he got two very good points. He kicked a couple of frees. Um, I thought Paul Murphy had a good second half. Gavin White was good going forward. Dave Moore, I thought, was outstanding, to be fair. And I think him going off for extra time was as much of a loss as David Clifford, who was brilliant. Um, I felt when David Moore went off, they lacked that bit of composure. Yeah. The, the prime example for me was um, David Clifford or David Moore won a one of three, a couple of yards outside the 45. Other fellas now would have been slowly getting up, putting it down the ground, waiting for Shawnee Shea. David was on the ground. He was looking up. He spotted David Clifford coming out. Quick 20-yard pop pass, bang, over the bar. They lacked that in extra time. Um, they lacked that bit of maturity. I think Tommy Walsh, who was, look, he was brave to take on that last shot, but who was there to try and take the ball off him? It wasn't. It was a very difficult chance for Tommy, but look, he had the bravery to go for it. I'd respect that every day of the week, but there was nobody looking to take the ball off him to help him out. Yeah, that's look. And I was thinking about this earlier because a lot of people are kind of having to go with Tommy Walsh. And look, I, I don't think he should have had the shot. I'm not defending it. But when we talked about Derry doing the same thing earlier in the year, you were defending the guy who took the shot because there was nothing else on. There was no, or they didn't take the shot, but you were defending the fact that they held on to it because there was never a shot on. And that's up to the people without the ball to go for it and to make a shot, whatever. It, it kind of, Kerry kind of fell between, isn't it? They did take the shot, but still nothing ever opened up and there was nobody trying to create that chance. And that, 
like it told me a lot i have to say about where they were because they'd fought back into it an extra time they should have had a little bit of momentum character. yeah exactly they'd actually showed that character but then it's like look david clifford's not on the pitch i understand that but there's still a lot of good forwards there to to just try and make that space or to beat the man and open it up or whatever it might be well that was the thing like and someone said to me oh david clifford's gone off your score was gone off and i was up well, that's rubbish because yes he was gone off he's a huge blow he was having a great game Shawnee Shea was still on the field Killian Spillane is a, is a scorer Paul Gain is a scorer that's what they're on the field to do and I'm not just pinpointing them boys but there was other players come on like like Kerry aren't a one man team or we hope or not um, we have good forwards starting but we also have very good forwards coming off the bench this is where character comes to the comes to the fore like this is where you want somebody brave to come take the ball and a lot of times there it could have been take the ball off tommy i think if a fella had gone into contact he would have got a free and you were looking for that bit of mature maturity and patience a bit of experience and it didn't come and um, i think fellas a lot of fellas didn't have a good game and fear fear crept in and they didn't want to be the person to taking the responsibility couple of comments here one of them uh from davy here saying why was uh potty clifford not switched inside he was left running around man marked wasting energy that's an inter- like and look he did a lot of work tracking back more than probably the rest of the carry forwards but i do wonder about that if you're being marked to be taken out of the game you know maybe this is well maybe this is the day then that we take that player out of the game with you know and we stay inside and and just react i suppose to what is happening to you rather than sort of saying oh geez Tyrone are the one calling all the shots yeah and look that's the thing the players like obviously management should see it too players should see it and the thing is with that carry for they should be able to rotate fairly fluidly go in and go because they're all good enough playing the different positions and that's something you have to geez i'm getting no joy here i'm gonna shoot inside now i'm gonna stand top of this top of the square there for a while and bring him something differently so it is a thing that the players like they're all good players are good intelligent players but i think they got so sucked into what was a battle and it was all oh, geez i need to get the next ball and it wasn't working well and like it is one of the ones it's, it's like everything you look back and go oh he should have been put here but they should have rotated more do you know get a fella on a bit of handy ball do you know um but that was his role he was arguably the top player in the country going into this because of his link play that was what was making Kerry tick was party clifford around the middle getting being the outlet for the defenders for kick pass being the link between the backs and the forward so just because he was beaten yesterday all of a sudden it is against oh he should, should have been put inside but that's mm. easy to say after he was one of the top players in the country um up to this point doing that role and he was just he was beaten by a by a great performance yesterday um so look it's easy to say oh we should have done this we should have done that um a lot of that comes down to experience as well i think the players you know they should know these things look a bit of rotation i'm sure that that that's what they've done in, in previous games they've moved around but look tyrone got their matchups right yeah. kerry didn't um so kerry had five weeks to prepare for this they didn't prepare they didn't look like they prepared properly call a spade mm. they, they didn't look like the style of play that they were trying to play it, it was very narrow for me um tyrone had four weeks uh we call them inter- interrupted weeks but whatever work they did on the pitch or, or I suppose they did no work on the pitch but whatever work they did in the pitch they looked like the team who had more preparation they looked like they had more work done in terms of their matchups their style of play their fitness was off the charts um so kerry have to look at a lot of different areas not just tactically physically wise they 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 tired it should have yeah. been the way around yeah um eilish is the thing here the, the goal that was missed was criminally be raging if your minor team missed such an opportunity and it was a bad like i mean maybe paul should have shot himself and definitely stephen shouldn't have been standing in the square but i think that was the one real goal chance and it actually leads me to another point because like that those things can happen but there was a four or five other cha- times that i think kerry went for goal and look watching it on the tv you're thinking goals on here but i was really impressed with how quickly tyrone recovered every single time but 
that I think might be the question is why didn't Kerry realise that that was happening? Because in the Munster Championship, I'm sorry, but they're, they are goal chances. You're going to at least get your shot off. But Tyrone didn't. Tyrone were always able to just kind of swarm around the ball when it looked like it might be on before the forward, forward had the chance to actually let fly. Yeah, and that just comes, they sense danger. Like it was selfless defending. Fellas yeah. were willing to sacrifice their own man to nullify an opportunity for Kerry. Like it was just, it was brilliant defending. It's, it's not a surprise that that's what Tyrone were doing. They were throwing their bodies on the line. Um, they were leaving their man to go to the point of danger. And like, my thing is, look, a lot of the goal chances, they were half chances. Mm. Half chances. Yeah, you'd say go from, but they were just the wrong decisions. No, it was great defending, but like, you miss a goal chance, two goal chances, or we call them chances, they were half chances. Eventually, you say, look, we need to just keep the scoreboard tipping over. Like, and it was just, Kerry was so naive and impatient. Yeah. It was just beyond belief. But isn't that what Dublin would have done? Would have, like in, in without like Dublin aren't the team to be lauding up today, yeah. but the Dublin team of a few years ago, like they would have beaten that Tyrone team by slowing it all down and saying, right, you're not going to give us the goals today, but we'll pop, we'll take the life out of the game, and then we'll pop it over the bar when it finishes, you know. And well, that's what you be able to stop it. You keep the scoreboard tipping on. Next thing you're up to three, four, and then that opportunity opens up, and then you are clinical with it. Kerry never got to that point. They got a point up or a two points up. They couldn't kick on because they were giving Tyrone more energy. Like you miss an opportunity like that, it's like getting a kick in the stomach for yourself because you're gutted the chance you've missed. But you're also giving the other team oxygen. Do you know, like it's like a score. And Peter Hart made an unbelievable block at one stage on Killian Spillane. Killian Spillane's right footed. He was going in and he's turning towards the defender to kick with his weaker foot mm. and show the bar but you're there going you're going more towards the man it was just like i feel like a broken record it, it was just decision making by kerry and i put that down to their lack of proper match intensity proper match sharpness um and training you just can't replicate the same stress and pressure you're on in games and obviously look decision making comes down to being in that position and experience and I personally felt that this Kerry team should have had enough experience around the place. Yeah. Can I, um, sorry, Paul is saying no, no harm, lads. All you are talking about is how Kerry lost um, and not how Tyrone won. Tyrone were the better team at the end of it. And I think we, we agree with that, absolutely. And it's just, there's there's more to talk about when it comes to Tyrone and we are, get, we are alluding to it, but the Kerry thing is interesting in its own way. There's no, um, the... This is a, an unfair question, right? But if the game was played three weeks ago, mm-hmm. and would would Kerry have won it? Do you think? And I don't mean sorry. I'm not talking about against half a Tyrone team as it would have had to be. I mean if there was no COVID issues at all. And what I mean, what the reason I ask that is because what we're talking about is that lack of intensity, the lack of ambition. They still wouldn't have had those games be any better against Cork and Tip and so on, but they would have been fret. They would have been more recent, at least. I think the big thing is, I think if this game was played three weeks ago, you wouldn't have got the same impact off Dara Canavan and... Um, so, taking all the excuses out of it, I think the couple of weeks extra gave a few of the Tyrone lads that were struggling with injuries or on the way back a better chance to be available. Um, whether Tyrone would have been less impressive or Kerry would have been better, who, who's to know? Um, but I definitely think that uh, the extra couple of weeks would have helped Tyrone um, in terms of the, the likes of Cotton McShane and a few more of them that were coming back from injury or had a few injuries and stuff, yeah. Um, so in that respect, you're taking one tree off Colin Shane coming off the bench. That's a that's a that's a huge impact. Um, so it would have been a different game. Uh, hard to know, really. Look, I just think Tyrone at this moment in time, they're finding that balance and they're they looking dangerous. And like like we were saying earlier, Sean was mentioning it before the Sunday game, they do have this um, unique ability 
to throw the chip on the shoulder and make it kind of us against the world. And um, that's an incredibly powerful thing for a team going out there thinking mm. nobody wants us to win. We'll prove them wrong. And um, yeah, look, they were the better team footballing wise. They made their better decisions. Um, I know we, I, I hate going down that road of, oh, they wanted it more, but they worked harder. And sometimes yeah. it is very simple. They worked harder. They were more intelligent on the ball. They saw danger quicker, which is game intelligence. And I, I, I like we keep going back to Kerry, but the thing, I think, like you said, it is interesting that Kerry were were so poor. Mm. They had opportunities, and you put it down to poor decision making. But also, Tyrone got so much right. I just think Kerry had five weeks to prepare for a game. You know what Tyrone are going to bring, but they still look like it was the first time ever playing them. Yeah. I kind of asked this question earlier, but I don't think I worded it right. Like, and it, it just goes to what you're saying. If Tyrone are coming out, like, if uh, making all those runs and doing it for 70 minutes, and you have to, 90 minutes as it turned out the mm -hmm. last night, and you do have to do it in every game, as you say, but it, you don't actually do it. You can't. It's impossible. People will say hunger or wanting it more, and it's not that. But if you have that chip in your shoulder and you are, you know, just like a zealot almost in your belief in going out and doing this for the team. If momentum is the wrong word, but if, if the game is going your way and the tactics are going your way, it is, it must be easier to make that run. You know, like it must be easier to track that man than when you feel like it's getting away from you or you feel they have our number today. Like it's not an excuse, but I'm just trying to figure out why one team would be doing it when the others aren't. It's not fitness surely. And it's not hunger. You know, what is it? No, like adrenaline gets you so far. But like you said, about tracking the man. How often did a Tyrone man have to track a Kerry man? Because very rarely Tyrone coughed up possession in the forwards and had to run back to mark space or track. They, they didn't have to do it. Most of the running was done on Tyrone's terms. Tyrone were a lot more um, shrewd up front. They didn't cough up ball, which means they had to go trying to nullify Kerry's counterattack, whereas most of the runs Tyrone were making, were they were making from the backs forward, which is always an easier run, because it's way easier running towards the opposition goal than it is running back towards your own. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember, very rarely in the game, Tyrone ever having to really put on the afterburners and chase one of the Kerry players running into space. Um, yeah. Most of the runs they were doing were on their own terms. And like that, if I go on a run this time, you might sit back. And when you're going on your run, I'll sit back. So you, you have ways of doing it where different fellas are getting their breeders at different times. But for me, Terry did most of the track, the chasing backwards, which yeah. is a lot more draining. It's a lot harder to chase somebody than have someone chasing you. And I think yeah. that was the key to it. Uh, like, like we said, they did it for seven, 90 minutes, which was absolutely insane stuff. Um, Kerry, I, I do think it comes down to they hadn't been pushed like that. They hadn't been tested. So many of them were going down with cramps. They didn't seem to have yeah. the energy laid on. And that's another area they'll have to look at because if you're not going to get tested in the build-up to these games, you have to alter your training. And look, obviously, I'm not in there. I don't know. But for me, too many of them were running out of steam. Yeah, a lot of cramp. I haven't seen... I haven't seen that many from one team in a long time. Uh, to, to your point, though, Tyrone got 2 9 of their 3 14 from turnovers, um, which I think says a lot. And look, yeah. in credit to them rather than necessarily even Kerry, they always played the game on their terms. Just one last thing before we go on again from a Tyrone point of view. I thought, um, Niall Morgan's performance yesterday was like even even some of the kickouts they didn't always go the way and the numbers might not look good but just in terms of what he's always trying and how he does almost play as that quarterback and be that in open play or from kickouts he really is if Cluxon isn't going to be around anymore Morgan is now the standard isn't he in terms of what a modern goalkeeper should be doing and I know we had the the Began versus Morgan kind of madness in the Ulster final and look Roy Began's outstanding as well but Morgan is that sort of, is the gold standard at the moment, isn't he? Oh, he is. And he, he is like a sweeper quarterback. And well, he also, he brings an assuredness, I think, to the defenders. They they have great trust in him. They have trust to give him the ball. They also have trust that if a ball goes 
over him that he'll be there to to collect it that he'll be off his line um obviously he kicked a ridiculous free um which i think would be replayed for years and years to come but he is like he he's a he's a footballer first and foremost he's a footballer that plays in goal is what i describe him as and i think i think that that gives the tyrone defense great confidence on that there's actually seven of them there to, so when they do turn out they have an extra outlet that is comfortable on the ball he's no problem carrying it or picking out a pass and like that he sees he has the whole pitch in front of him he sees danger so if carrier come up the field he's pushing out and he's looking at other oh, space there and he's probably getting a head start to cut off that space where he's anticipating the ball to travel so for me he's the platform do you know and in fairness the kickouts they weren't great just they carry dominated but i think it's the probably an aura or the confidence that he gives in the defense mm. that they can go they can go for it like if balls coming in they have no problem they're not going to stand back and leave a fellow in handy they're going for it because they have great trust in him behind them yeah absolutely well look there's, there's even more we could talk about here it was such an unbelievable game but um in the end throwing were too good for kerry and kerry go back to the drawing board They'll be doing it without Peter Keane, you'd imagine, without like I mean, it's the the, the three years yeah. you know, is up and it probably feels like a natural transition at this point. Yeah, I think look, I think he got three years. I'm not sure. Maybe he might look for another year. Um whether he'll get it now. I think they've underperformed. And um I just don't I just don't see who is the ready made replacement mm. at the moment. Whoever it seems gets it, or the names you're hearing, um, they would be a bit of a punt. Um, you're you're not you're not getting um, probably a really made replacement. I don't think. But my thing is really with uh, Kerry management, it's about a management team. You know, you're not going to get one perfect manager. But I think if the, if the, if a man gets the job and he surrounds himself with the right people. I think they could do very well, but I think it's about a team in general, not just like you can name out any manager go, oh, he will or won't do well, but I think it's about the personnel he brings with him because there's just so much more to it. I think if you're the manager of the team now, you're you're managing. You're not the best coach in the world or SNC or whatever. You're getting the best people available to you around you, and then you're managing them and you're managing the team. So um, it'll be an interesting one uh, like that to be names going around for a while. Yeah. I'm not sure what Peter's plans are, but look, it'll be an interesting one because, like we've said earlier, Kerry, 2014, since their last All Ireland, becoming a famine. Um, so they need to make the most of it. Yeah, well, a famine, seven years and counting. Never, I didn't even think it, didn't even realize that, but she was Dublin won six in a row. So, yeah. Um, James Horn was at the match yesterday with Kieran McDonald uh, watching on, or Saturday, I should say. Yeah. They've had a fair warning on that uh, Tyrone performance, and you know I think they, they probably would be ready anyway. They'll have four weeks off, um, which is a long time. And obviously, we're talking about Ke Kerry being off for five. Um, we'll have a proper chat about it, and we'll go into the details and stuff like that before the final. But if you were to call it now, two weeks out, Mayo to break the, the their famine, a real famine, not a Kerry famine, <laughs> or Tyrone to do it again. Um... On yesterday's performance, to be fair, like I've been tipping Mayo. Mayo. Mayo mm -hmm. so, um, I just think, I think Mayo would have preferred to play Kerry. I think on Tyrone's performance, if they can bring that same, I'm going to call it a level of control to the game where they control the opposition and play their own game. I've said it before, they're the only team that can play two games in one match or, or two matches in one game, whatever way you want to put it. They can nullify you and play their own game. I think with Mayo's running style, they're very good at um, directing you into traffic, Tyrone. So on yesterday's evidence or Saturday's evidence, I'd be tipping Tyrone. Okay, there you go. So that's a change. So now you've recovered. You've tipped Tyrone to win the match. You've tipped yeah, Mayo to win the All-Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, thanks. look, he's confused. Kerry have been knocked out, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> or knocked out surprisingly. Darren, thanks so much uh, for a uh, great analysis there, and we'll chat to you before the final. Cheers, Nick. Talk to you later.
thanks a million again to Darren. Um, if you're watching on YouTube and you're enjoying what you're seeing, please subscribe to the channel. We're here with you every week um, for GA season. There's lots more as well. Uh, besides, if you're listening on the podcast and you're not already subscribed, please do. And also, uh, please leave a comment and a rating for us. It really helps. Now, we'll talk to Maris Brosnan in a few minutes about some of the TV coverage around the game and lots more as well. He'll get into some of the some of the tactical stuff that we've touched on there. But before we do that, our man Finch has been making some great little videos for us over the course of the GEA season here on GAA Embedded. And we've got one more for you today where we look at some of the top performances, individual performances on losing teams in GEA history. This is a great one. Of players that can will their team against all odds to victory. It's part of what makes sport great. But what happens when you put in a Trojan effort, but yet you still come up short? Surely that lives in folklore somewhere. So we're running through 10 of the best performances on losing teams in GAA history. Of course, it should come as no shock, but it's a testament to Limerick hurling that Claire's Tony Kelly could win man of the match, score 17 points, eight of them from play, and yet they can still run out easy 10 point winners. Our heart still bleeds for you, Tony. It really, really does. Although Cork were thwarted by Limerick this year, we're going back to 2019 for this one. And Patrick Horgan, probably one of the greatest hurlers who may yet never win an All-Ireland, was in imperious form against Kilkenny, yet still lost. Three goals, 10 points, and an L. The last man to win man of the match in an All-Ireland final, despite being on the losing side. That's how good Porrick Kelly was in this match. In 1993, he had won the All-Ireland club final. His Galway team had shocked tip, and yet PJ Delaney thwarted him from winning it all. Following his announcement of inter-county retirement, all of us had wax lyrical about how good Joe Canning was, but this All-Ireland qualifier against Cork marked his arrival. Galway lost 23 points to 215, but Canning scored 212, and a fair chunk of them were from play. The 1980 All-Ireland semi-final between Offaly and Kerry saw Matt Connor's signature performance. Kerry were on their way to a third All-Ireland in a row, and Connor hit 2 9 in a high scoring game, and it wasn't good enough for Offaly to win. I wonder what happened to that Offaly team actually. Did they do anything in the intervening years? The 2013 All Ireland semi final between Kerry and Dublin saw the switch. The Gooch going from corner forward to centre forward, and his first half performance had everyone frothing at the mouth at how good he was. And yet, Dublin still managed to win. 318 to 311. There's no I in team, but if you're Seamus Cannon in the 2015 All Ireland semi final, there is an I in Tipperary. Out of Tipperary's 316 score, Callanan scored 3 9. That was his second championship hat trick in a row against Galway, and it wasn't good enough for victory. If Peter Canavan never won an All Ireland in the 2000s, this match would be earmarked as the reason why he should have won. As Tyrone narrowly missed out to the dubs, Canavan scored 11 of his county's 12 points as they just about missed out on All-Ireland glory. The 2008 All-Ireland quarterfinal between Kerry and Galway is recalled far more than a common or garden All-Ireland quarterfinal. And as the rain barreled down on Crow Park and the floodlights turned on early, Michael Murphy kicked 10 points in a losing effort as Galway won plaudits for their attractive style of play. We apologise to all the Galwegians watching. We assure you that yes, you did win a few matches over the last 30 or so years, but not this one. Joe Cooney's first half display in the 1990 All-Ireland Final was the stuff of legend, but Cork came rallying back in the second half to give them the All-Ireland. Now, Morris Brosnan joins us uh, from Melbourne, as you can see, getting inside the game. We've lots to talk about on the Kerry Jerome situation. We're going to get into the TV coverage in just a couple of seconds, Morris, which I'm very excited about, I have to say. It's been my main thing, my main topic of conversation in my brain for the whole weekend. But uh, 
let's put it out into the open uh before we do though uh that video i swear to god some memories there i have to say um and maybe, maybe history doesn't remember these performances as fondly as if they were winning performances but uh some of those ones i have to say i was at them i was at those games and they live long in the memory yeah absolutely i think we spoke about the joe game uh just in the aftermath of his retirement so, yeah. that yeah that 2008 game and i mean it is kind of it's kind of scary when you think back on the situation that he was in at, at that time and uh, what it paved the way for you know that was you know it's the, we i often associate the the reliance on joe with the famous johnny glenn interview and that kind of explosion and you know the the idea that got our one-man team and it's funny it was established you know half a decade before that like it, it's kind of remarkable that that's where it kicked out of i was actually watching back the Speaking of um, last weekend, I was watching back the Kerry Tyrone 2008 game, and it is kind of frightening to watch how good Declan Sullivan was in that game on a, in a losing team as well. Uh, just you know, it's I, I've often said I think he when he was fit was the complete forward in terms of he was elite ball carrier, elite creator, elite scorer, and he demonstrated it all in that game. Um, there was a clip that was going on on Twitter. I think I put it up on Twitter. Uh, I did put up on Twitter of uh, Brian Dewar's point, but if you watch uh, Declan Sullivan's block and carry from that, and then you watch back the game and he does it over and over again, he's got a point in his left foot, like a little lob early in that game. And you, you know, you go back and remember that game, Mick, uh, the, the two McMahons had Tommy Walsh and Kieran Donnelly, you know, on a leash. Uh, he was their kind of sole creator. I actually think if Kerry had played two of the lines that day with a bit of nous, it would have won, which uh, I guess brings us to what happened on Saturday <laughs> because it, <laughs> it was a pretty similar situation. Yeah, history might repeat, history might repeat. That clip, by the way, if anybody hasn't seen it, and a lot of people did, Morris, it went, uh, you went a little <laughs> bit mini viral over the course of the last week, but uh, it's just so much in, as you said, like what is it, a minute and 10 seconds of action in the championship ending with Brian Dewar's famous point. It's well worth checking out. But get into the Kerry Toronto. I, one that jumps out to me that is on that list, but I, I'll never forget it, being at the game, was the All Ireland semi final in 2015 with that uh, tip and um, Galway and Seamus Callanan's 3 9. Yeah. It's not the most amazing scoreline. There's better scorelines even on that list, but just how dangerous he was and how every time he got Galway should have won that game by 20 points. But every time <laughs> the ball went into the full forward line, Seamus Callanan scored. And I remember Porek Mannion was put on him. He wasn't on him originally. He was corner back those days. And I, in the second half, I was like basically in line with the full forward line from the Hogan stand. And, uh, you know, I spent the next two years not believing in Porrick Mannion. He won in All-Ireland and it wasn't until the 2018 All-Ireland final the year after that I kind of realised, wait a second, this guy is an elite, brilliant turner. And it was because of the fool Seamus Callan made him that day. That was entirely not his fault. So that I think that just, just to put that particular performance on a pedestal, that's the impact it had on me. It made me blind to the yeah. virtues of one of the best players <laughs> in the country for two full years after. <laughs> I think for a lot of people, uh, my generation, Joe Canning did the same thing to The Rock O'Sullivan. I, I, yeah, I actually yeah. think that you know a lot of people would have uh, very different memories of him because they wouldn't have remembered him early on and then they suddenly seen this kid just give him an absolute roasting. But as it turns out, he did it to a lot of people after that too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, we'll move on then. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, obviously we've talked to Darren about lots of different things about what happened in that game, but uh, on Saturday, and look, I think everybody is agreed that Tyrone were worthy winners while also agreeing that Kerry were naive and probably should have done a lot more. And I think that's like that's fair enough. I know for some reason both sides seem to get angry at, at, at that basic analysis, but you have, I suppose, an issue with... The analysis being a little bit too basic on what we see on our national broadcaster and in how we are presented with um the game both in live sense and then in the highlights thing last night on the sunday game are we being shorn of true analysis of why tyrone won that game and why kerry lost that game you've written a piece people will see it later on today on balls that and can read about it but we're going to have a sneak preview slash debate about it right now yeah like i guess uh, in a sense, Mick, I'm kind of I'm nearly sick of talking about this because I, you know it's gone to a stage now where I'm getting DMs from people talking about their grievances with coverage. I've so for some reason I've become known giving out about TV coverage, which obviously isn't what I what I want. And I should just stress, I mean, the I, I guess where I think the the whatever you want to call it the problem is is that for for decades, if you go back to the '90s, right, or they did a survey. Uh, this is the you know soccer coverage has always steered ga coverage that has always been the way and rt did a survey with their soccer panel 
And it, it turns out that I think 30% of respondents said that they understood the game. So that means that you had a huge cohort of people who didn't really understand the game and they needed it to be dumbed down, uh, simplified. They were totally content with this, you know, uh, pub talk. So the type of stuff you'd be having on bar studios with your friends, terrorist talk, whatever you want to call it. That, that did them fine. And that then led to the coverage of GA. So we saw that and, you know, you had the odd debate thrown in, uh, it was all surface level stuff and that was all fine. Now, what I think increasingly is happening and why you see a lot of people uh, increasingly complaining about punishment, I suppose, is because we're a generation now of player, coach, and as a consequence of that, spectator, and they actually do want deeper stuff, immersive analysis. Now, I, sh I, I should stress, like, they, they shouldn't, the tail doesn't wag the dog. They are still a minority to my mind. There's a core base of people who are totally happy with what we got at the weekend, liked a bit of chat, loved the debate on Saturday. It was all fine and dandy for them. And to, to my mind, actually, the punditry's failure to address this is the reason that uh, you, you look across the sphere, GA podcasts are so popular right now. They're, you know, by large, it's a really, really he a heavily saturated market and they're all really successful. And to my mind, the reason they're successful is because it's a niche that they don't get on TV. You don't get that in-depth discussion and analysis. It just doesn't happen, right? And m maybe that's fine. You know? Maybe that's the way that people who have that sort of interest are there for. So you go back to Saturday, to me, it started off, like, I, to be honest, I thought it was good. And, you know, it was it's a great clip. It was very entertaining. John Cavanaugh and Pat Spillan debate, whatever, you know, it, it was a laugh. I, nobody was turning off the TV at all. But it became the basis of everything that happened thereafter. So yeah. at halftime, um, Pat Spillan tries to talk about uh, where they're going wrong. And John Cavanaugh pipe spikes up and he starts to talk about, um, what, you know, it takes a carry man when somebody, lays, you know, God forbid somebody put a hand on a carry man, which yeah. is a bit... A bit kind of surface level, a bit petty, to be honest. and that it yeah. just keeps going over and over and over again to the end of the game where you're hearing, you know, the, that the game is uh, Tyrone won because of hunger, they had more intensity, they had, you know, co copy paste stuff. You, you could, if I read the transcription of that analysis to you and I told you to pick a guess at which game it was of, you picked any game of the championship, you know, that could have been after the All Ireland Hurling final, you, I could have played a similar thing for you after Dublin Mayo, you wouldn't tell any difference because it, it's it's bland, it's very, very standard stuff. And a lot of people are totally happy with that, right? So either you either do one or the other, to my mind. What happens now is that they do, they do neither. So you get, they try and use stats that are just routinely wrong, which infuriates people a lot more. You talk to other analysts, like intercounty analysts about this, they'll bring it up often, you know. Uh, I, I give an example in that piece, the Leinster final, 50 minutes gone in the Leinster final, 14 points to seven, Dublin up. And a graphic, a shiny graphic shines up on the screen, scores some play, Dublin zero out of 14, Kildare is easy. Like it's just, you know, whatever, that's a mistake, whatever you want to call it, but you, you're not using statistics yeah. correctly. They're oftentimes cold commentators are using them, they're, they're wrong or they're, they're absolutely meaningless. So I, I, I think, you know, if you want to appeal to, I have family members who love that kind of stuff, the, what you saw on Saturday and what you saw on Sunday. And maybe the likes of myself just need to get it elsewhere now because we're not getting it on TV. And uh, the, the fact that they're trying to, Include it is only actually making it worse. It's actually it's nearly vexing me more. I'd be interested to know like what you thought of even Saturday, for example, because to my mind, I did yeah. think that while it was one good moment, it just became too much. Okay, can I give you a wider shot first, and then I'll get into Saturday because I did think sure. it was a bit different. So I have to say that I'm somewhere in between. Like I, one of my issues lately in in soccer into ga as you say that tends to they tend to want to lead into the other is that what we miss in the old days of the giles dunphy brady is the ability to throw out the running order and to focus on one thing and have a big long discussion about it and i feel that it's become sterile lately in that right we've had this discussion now we have to move on to the analysis we have to move on to the to what we've already prepared you know and yeah. while i feel that that at a certain point maybe around sort of 2010, 2011, became, oh, this is our successful formula, let's go with it. So therefore it became contrived and useless. It, it, you know, it, it loses all of its magic because it became, oh, we stumbled on this winning formula, let's go always to the winning formula. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, of course, yeah. And, and GEA, I think, always a couple of years behind. Uh, for example, I used to love Joe Brawley on the panel. But by the time he was let off, I mean, you had millions of discussions about it. I didn't want them there because I thought it was all pantomime. And if it's not real, that play, that has no place on TV. Yeah. Now, so while you might want the more analysis, for example, I thought they had a nice blend on the Sunday game. You're saying do one or the other. This is last night's um, 
uh, show now with Tomas O'Shea. Whereas right, I thought show, yeah. I did learn a bit about the game. I learned from Tomas on both occasions, actually, not from the other two, as to Kerry not tracking the runners. That's something you just don't see in real time, really, unless you're really looking out for it when you're just following the ebb and flow of the game. The Paul Ganey, Connor Myler clip, I thought, was really, really brilliant analysis and a really good insight. And so also earlier on with Kerry's kind of like blind play going forward. I think that was a little bit more obvious to see, but it was still good to be highlighted and that's good analysis, but they were also having the more wider discussions and so on. Now, would I like that to be in a situation where the running order was thrown out and we stopped and talked about why Kerry are in this position or who is the person to replace Peter Keane if he's not the man to do it? Of course, that would be better than I think it's sort of a right well we have to get to the next thing we have to yeah, make sure we on. cover everything mm-hmm. discussed in the in the meeting that's my personal opinion and i felt they actually did a good blend and we can get on to that saturday now is a weird one because i'm going against my own thing it was i thought very from the minute it started i thought it was very genuine but i thought that it was borderline unprofessional i thought that sean kavanagh went on and within two seconds was giving out about a, a Tyrone conspiracy theory, basically, about the whole country being against them and being unfair on them and so on. Pat Spillane, as he is prone to do, played into it perfectly. But you could tell Pat's playing the game. Yeah, Sean, yeah. Couldn't, Sean was angry, and he remained angry for the entire show, and I thought that made it difficult. It was, As you said, it's entertaining, but nobody's getting anything out of it. And yeah, I, that- I thought that the analysis of the entire show suffered because Sean Kavanagh was angry and he couldn't properly analyze the game. I don't, we, I had this discussion on Twitter, sorry to go on, about if you can't put aside your bias for your analysis, then you shouldn't be on the show. I don't necessarily think you have to always have neutral analysts. I think there's a p- place for, I'm for Toronto. Anthony Daly would be on and he would talk about it being, you know, about his, wanting Claire to do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. But when he does the analysis piece, you trust that he's take, taken both sides equally as seriously. He's able to separate yeah. his job from his passion. And that was where I thought there was a problem on Saturday. I didn't think there was a separation between the passion and the job they were there to do. And, like, I think you hit the nail in the head there, really, to be honest. I'm, uh, the, the Sean Cavanaugh stuff, I was just, <laughs> like, I don't know where you start with that, to be honest. I, I thought, uh, <laughs> you know, I was, I was at the time, I was roaring was laughing angry about it. I was, the second he went on air. It was just totally bizarre, you know. He has like he, his stuff with Kerry is very weird, you know. Like going back, we talked about uh, this a couple of weeks ago about the you know rivalries, past pairs and rivalries. Like I remember a couple of years ago, he was writing about the pairs patronising them after a league game, and you know the whole Tyrone squad and Mickey Hart had come out after that and said it was they were paying their respects to Mickey Hart. Like it was it was widely established, but for some reason he interpreted it as a slight, and he just seems to have this. I don't know, being his bonnet that was very very evident on Saturday. And I guess my my point really, Mick, is that you know. The, uh, whatever like that that i'm not the target audience for that i'm very conscious that i'm not the target audience for that and maybe rte's attitude is listen let him go off like let this is entertaining a lot of people will be talking about this afterwards and then we'll get into the real nitty gritty stuff elsewhere you know if you want if you want proper analysis go on to their website today aiden o'rourke has written a brilliant piece breaking down the game mm. you know li- th- you know i would much rather listen to what darren is going to say uh, or what darren has said about the Kerry game versus you know uh what you got off- after the game in, in the media aftermath the stuff about like I, I find the personally insulting. Really, to be honest, when you hear, hear one team wanted it more than the other, like it just it's it's baffling. It's patronising to Tyrone because it, you you know you're saying I think it undermines their skill, like their technically. It's also very very patronising to the carry players. You know to say that that stuff like hunger and they wanted it more. You know like are you are you telling me you know Paddy Clifford who talked to locals in Fossa about the work Paddy Clifford has put in in the last eighteen months. You know this is a guy who didn't make a minor in twenty one team who broke himself like the physical condition the, the, the kg he's put on in the last six months you're telling me he didn't want it as much as conor moyler like this it's obviously it's i think that it's a really easy trap to fall into when you're not capable yeah. of talking about wider turnovers tackle technique that kind of stuff and maybe you know maybe without 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 it, get, it's it's simplistic but i do want i just want to interrupt for a second because i agree look i don't think anybody wants it more than the other but that is there they that is the language of the terrace as you know yeah yourself, exactly as yeah, yeah. You've ever been. Yeah. and that's not good enough to put that and, and and use it on tv when you know better okay but what i would ask you is there's definitely an intangible that is in that family but that isn't hunger or desire or work you know like that is but there's an intangible that can't be analyzed by 
tactical breakdowns. Okay. Yeah. Right? And I'm just, we just need to, I, my argument would be instead of it being kind of like an insulting thing to say that Kerry didn't want it as much, we need to find what that language is. I don't know what the word is, but we all know, and me and you've had this discussion many times in, in GEA, there is that moment where 10 minutes into a game, you can sense that. And again, the language is wrong. Your, my word would always be they're more up for it. But it's, and do you know what? I think in a weird way, it's actually the dreaded I word. I think it is an intensity thing that, and I know it sounds lazy, but I really do think it matters. And it doesn't come from not wanting it as much. It comes from just yeah. a weird like ability to hit the ground running and to go out and to deliver at 100% as opposed to the other team not being able to, and you're catching up for the entire game and you can't get to the, to the, to the, to the run of the game. And maybe Mick, maybe why like it's really interesting you say that because we've we've used that word uh, a lot of times. And maybe the reason that these conversations are a lot more suitable for podcasts is because you have the scope to delve into like why is that the case? Say, for example, you look at the weekend and what went on with Kerry and we talk about like you know intensity. So you would go back and I would look at, for example, I think Kerry, you know, they they were 30, give it 35, I don't turn them over 35 times. 30 of them were in the attacking third, which is just is a phenomenal statistic, right? You look at um the two goals they conceded were so demonstrated of their problems for me. The the first goal, is, you, you go back and watch that goal. It's a turnover. David Clifford takes, I don't know if you remember, takes a solo to Manny, it's yeah. turned over. Tyrone worked the goal. So it's it's five passes. They, that, so Tyrone can turn over the ball inside their own 45. It's five passes to the other goal. Now, if, if I was to ask you, how many carry players, I'm not even talking about a tackle, a statistic tackle. How many carry players would you guess put their hand on a ball carrier, got their hand to a player? It was one. The one player got his hand up, which is just, it's, you know, it's such, it's so demonstrative of a, a bigger problem. The second goal, this is, this, that's 12 passes. That's the one, you, you know, this is the turnover deep in the own half, trying to work the ball. How many players in, within those 12 passes, again, working to feed the ball, 12 passes, one player again, hand on the ball. Moynihan got his hand to McGeary. He actually, I, it looked like maybe McGeary might have overcarried there. Uh, Moynihan was definitely convinced of it. That was the only time that a carry player got their hand on a, on a player. So that's, you know, mm. I think it would be very fair to say that is evidence of a, of a lack of intensity. So then you take it a step further and say, right, where does that come from? Kerry's tackling, to my mind, has gotten significantly worse since 2019 when they played Dublin. What has changed since then? Donnie Buckley, who we know is a renowned coach for his tackling. Uh, we've had people on the uh, podcast previously uh, a couple of years ago we spoke to lee keegan who raved about the box sessions that they used to do uh, in mayo with donny buckley is that a factor maybe it is he left uh, last year in, in fairly accurate circumstances there definitely is uh, a problem with Kerry's tackling you know as in their technical tackling ability has lessened significantly they don't put enough pressure on the ball up the field so you, you get a situation where players are able to overrun them and that's when suddenly you know the blame might come to a fullback but the problem is further up the field when you're not pressurizing the ball and that all comes down to you could summarize that all up like the, the tenth pole that we're going to throw all this over is intensity right but the reason that this conversation is, is fair than say that conversation is because you can point to demonstrative evidence of where those issues lie whereas mm. you know af after a game it is just kind of this you know it, it, it always hungry. it is always always coming down to intensity it is always coming down to hunger it is always and I, let's say right i the point of my piece isn't to i plow on with that to be honest you know like the my like my mother watches the sunday game she doesn't care about productivity and efficiency and turnover rates she like you know it doesn't matter to her yeah laugh about past plan and that kind of stuff and plow on with that where i do think we're, we're, we're being slightly let down is that we don't have a midweek analysis show to actually delve into that stuff i think the demand for that has never been greater because of this new generation who've been reared on you know you mentioned soccer like the Monday night football is a classic example we've been reared and uh, embraced that and we don't have that in ga which i just think is a massive shame now i would just as i said before i would say that stuff is the reason that this stuff is elsewhere is because the demand is there for it you know i i'm firmly of the belief that demand is there for it i don't believe you can I think it's nearly insulting to the average GA fan to say that they're not interested in that kind of stuff because there's a big enough cohort out there who are, we actually, you know, if you want to get into behind the baseball here, like uh, we are inside baseball, we would definitely be able to prove, you know, there is a, a firm interest in analytics, statistical based uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I say, we're, we're not getting it on TV and maybe that's fine. Like I, I, I'm, as yeah. I say, I'm in no doubt that I was not the target audience of what happened on Saturday. Yeah. We should also mention that Sky do it a, like you know it's it, it's not perfect and there's always going to be limits to a tv show but i think they do make an effort and i think that yeah. peter canavan and james o'connor in particular uh in in the football and hurling uh respectively do uh you know make a bit of an effort and, and within a live show as well they don't have the benefit of 24 hours i would say that the sunday game again for me i thought they struck a balance last night i do think it needs to be for 
your mother to 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 watch back the game, but also <laughs> why not throw in a little bit of you know of, of actual explanation for us as well? And again, like I think to to suggest they didn't do a good job last night, in my, in my opinion, like again, both of the the pieces of analysis by Tommaso Shea, like. I saw the Tyrone goal live and I never saw it again, the first goal, and thought, oh my God, this is one of the best goals I've ever seen in Crow Park. You know, the movement, the, and all of that is true. But when you look at it from the Kerry defensive point of view, it lessens the quality of the goal slightly, you know? And, and I think it's important to see that in both sides, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, I, I find that there, there was a balance there last night that was decent. And I think it was because they had one um, senior um, men's game anyway to 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 analyze that they gave the bulk of the show to and it was the same with the all ireland uh the the semi-final a couple of weeks ago it's always different with the finals because they bring in they start doing team of the year discussions and so on and so forth but um with the mayo um with the with, with the two hurling semi-finals and the mayo dublin game i thought they did a similar job and i was i just felt it was a nice i like it was a serious conversation it wasn't it wasn't full of nonsense and arguing and fighting and then maybe it could have obviously could have went one more generic way and one more tactical way. And I suppose my my argument is that that's fine. And your argument is that you're falling between two stools and you're serving nobody by doing the in between job. To a certain no, I, well, like yeah, more or less. I kind of agree with you more or less on the Sunday game last night because uh, mm. uh, I, I the template that you could adopt for a midweek analysis show is that you pick one or two games go really heavy on it like i i, I think tomas O'Shea is by and large the best one that uh she has even yeah but like I, I think you know there's there's scope for i guess is what i'm saying mick you know the, the it's funny the, like we got the stuff post game and i think fair enough you know that's that's not for us and then we go to the sunday game and the first question is about uh is it too simple and you're you're, you're back to this idea again where you know i just think it's a constraint that they're grappling with that that could have been a talking points show and then you could have a midweek analysis show i just firmly believe that if we had you know as a ga fan you know look around you and you look at the the way the game's being covered and punishing in particular and i just think we're being shortchanged to a large yeah. extent not to have that there this make this you know how many times have i been texting you or we've talked on this before about the camera missing uh puck outs or kick outs right like that's that's an issue that's going back years and years i Interviewed um Ollie Baker, the famous he hit against Tipperary. You know the one. It, 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 the cameras missed it. He caught the ball in midfield, turned, put it over bar. He he never see it. He actually knew he, the cameras missed it because he glanced up at the screen. They were still showing a replay of the puck out. So you know this. I now this is what is this ninety seven? Like this is you know over twenty years ago, and we that mistake is still being made. You know you, talk, you fast forward twenty years. So and and the reason that the from a, a match director perspective, you know the, the technology like we've actually seen ten bits there to capture you know the box and box or whatever you want to call it that um, tg carry use the reason that it's not a capability thing the capability is there the reason they don't do it is because they don't think there's enough interest in it that a lot of people don't really care about puck outs or kickouts they're more interested in you know seeing the scores seeing the highlights taking the game mm -hmm. that stuff doesn't matter to them whereas there's a, a a new cohort a very sizable cohort who want to see the greatest weapon in get football right now is what Niall morgan is doing off a tee or Stephen yeah. hooks did before him they want to see that they want to see Four core presses. There's a huge, like a massive size of people who feel like they're being shortchanged by TV, yeah. but not getting to see that. And You're I think right on that. Yeah, like I mean, no, yeah. I, I, we're going to have a discussion during the week, and people will see it on Tuesday with our our, our role in All Stars team. And there's going to be a good few thrown in. But like for me, I spent a lot of yesterday thinking, is Niall Morgan going to replace Rory Began on that team? And one of the things was he was losing a considerable amount of kickouts while clearly having this you know this kind of like display for the ages in open play and you know yeah he, he, but at the same time i wanted to see the context of some of those kickouts if he's trying that little bit more to get that extra edge it's more forgivable than if he's just kicking the ball out over the line and not really you know being inaccurate and you don't get that in the live tv coverage you just don't you know and that's um it's unfortunate and look not everybody there is needs to pick a role in all-stars team but people do want to see how players are performing and especially the most important players on the field which are the goalkeepers now i'm so glad you said that that the the best example if people want to know the different perception from a player versus the the average punter go back and read nile morgan's interview with balls uh, around was it this time last year it was around this time last year i think uh, oh no, sorry, it would have been later in the year. It was it was after someone were knocked out of the 20th championship. Go back and read it. Nine Morgan talks about OTE analyzing his 
kickouts. This, you know, he said, we talk about statistics, right? He said, there's this nonsense, absolutely nonsense obsession with retention rates. How many kickouts do you obtain? The goal of every, Niall Morgan's goal with every single kickout is his score. He doesn't, he doesn't want, if he loses the ball, he doesn't care if the stat looks bad and RT are criticizing him. He wants them to work a score. So when they go, that's why they go long, because your chances, Kerry went short with 17 or kickouts yesterday. I think they were four points off it. Like they're, they're, it was below 20% convert kickouts. So the Shane Ryan look, comes really looks great. You know, listen, he's, uh, what is he, like 100% re retention from his kickouts. But how many scores does he work off his kickouts? The retention doesn't matter. Niall Morgan, in that interview, he said, go back and watch RT, and they're pausing cameras, and they're saying, oh, look at the option over here. Why did Niall Morgan kick it over here? He's his leg cocked, and he's wound up. Like, the decision where he's kicking is made long before then. Now, that's from a player's perspective, so he doesn't care. Like, you know, the, the point, but that's what I'm saying to you, right? There's, there's people who actually would be, I think, interested in Niall Morgan's perspective on that. I want to actually understand, you know, why, why did retention rates not work? I, I did um, a coaching conference a couple of years ago, Aidan O'Rourke, who I just mentioned earlier, the uh, former MAF footballer, and the, he was doing a, a pitch session, right? And he was talking about, you know, these are the kickouts we'll use here. And, you know, you could be obsessed with your retention and you can tap the corner back all day and get 100% and look at this great stat and make you feel good. But if you're not working scores after, they're not worth a damn. And that's it. So every single... So the, the reason you know you get these break rate in pockets uh deep left deep right is because you get players running over ball that's creates an overlap that dramatically increases your chance of a score now if it doesn't come off you lose the kick out and you know what have you you have to try and, but even if you lose it up there you can try and force a turnover so that's the level of understanding that like coaches know this stuff already right most uh inter-county players will be very very and i think that that's a window uh a resting window that we as spectators would love to be able to see into and the majority of the time we don't yeah, and look, I just the last thing on this, and I, I think you'll agree on this, is that it, it's easy to throw stones, and there's a lot of limitations and on what they're able to do. And also, I would say that they are catering to a very, very wide audience. My point, and I think your point as well, I, I hope anyway, is like there you can put these things into the general conversation without them coming across as nerdetry <laughs> for want of a better <laughs> word, it is word. Uh, you know you can just make this part of the conversation like there's no reason why the cocom can't be talking about my morning's kickouts all them you make a story of it it becomes part of the game then you know it becomes part of like you know the 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 in-game analysis of who of the winning and losing of the game there's nobody doesn't want that i don't think i don't think the casual viewer just wants us talking about intensity and hunger all day and about how they should have got that point you know, or or he should have like the every the only analysis is whether somebody kicked a bad wide or kicked a good score. You know, I don't think anybody wants that, and I think you can fit all these things in, and make them a part of the narrative, and people just want the narrative at the end of the day. Yeah, I I mean, yeah, I hundred percent agree with you. Like, I I think there there definitely is scope to get a balance. I, my I guess my point is that I don't know if there's uh, as much interest in striking that balance as opposed to you know trying to tick a couple of different boxes and you end up falling down between two stools. Yeah. But look, look, I mean, you know, this stuff is when you talk about this stuff, it it always comes across as being oversimplified and like it is worth stressing how I I personally think how good like across the board the punditry has been this year. Like we mentioned Tomas there, I think uh, James O'Connor on the screen for some of the stuff he did uh, for Sky Sports this year was just absolutely fascinating. So yeah, I think, in you know, real time, like, well, like it's amazing. Which is so hard to do. That's such it's such an unbelievable skill to turn stuff around. Like not just from um an individual perspective or from a team perspective you know that you know you're talking about cutting clips getting that uh, stats together it's such a hard thing to do and this stuff always comes across as being oversimplified when you talk about it on um on podcasts like this but you know like, at the end of the day i just i do think there's there's scope to do more and maybe right maybe this is the early days of that developing and we will see that over the coming years i'm uh, you know the if you were to be the optimist in me hopes that is the case yeah Okay, before we move on, or before we go, uh, it's uh, since the back door came in, uh, which is also the start of this century, Galway and Mead in 2001, Tyrone and Armagh in 2003, uh, Cork and Down in 2010, and Donegal and Mayo in 2012 are the only All-Ireland finals without Dublin or Kerry in it. This is good for the game that we're going to have Tyrone and, and, and Mayo, and it's a new, like they've played each other over the years, but there's no like real intense famous rivalry there between these two teams i remember the more in underage finals to be honest I, I, one in particular that, that comes to mind like <laughs> this is i think 2013 the under the minor final um not sure about that <laughs> i should have that more. but i think this is great for the game that we're going to have a new pairing in an all Ireland final i yeah 100 percent agree with you. yeah I, I think it's it, there's a real novelty factor around uh this final i think they're 
but both the fact that you know that neither of these teams have won an Ireland in Triumph's case in over a decade, in Mayo's case, we don't even need to go there. Um, but also just the fact that the I think there are two teams that play uh um not to go all nerdy here, like a modern brand of football. You know, you get really fluid play, really athletic footballers. I think they're that matchups was very exciting, you know, if, to to look at it from from that perspective, and you know, uh, in ter- also in terms of the, just the pure getting away from Dublin and Kerry, that which was you know, or Dublin in particular, this kind of perceived dominance, I think, uh, is it will only be good for the game. It's a final. I'm really looking forward to. You know, I uh, I would. This is a conversation for another day. I my, my my own personal feelings about the last two years of championship football. I I honestly think the quality of football for the first time in my lifetime has declined collectively here. Right, you know, like individually, you still players definitely benefited from the pandemic in terms of their conditioning and uh, individual technical skills. But collectively, I think the game understanding, uh, game management, cohesion, uh, defensive organization, attack and structures have all declined in the last few years. That just just my own personal opinion. I even thought that on Saturday as entertaining as it was, I thought it was. Uh, a low quality game this conversation for for another day but i do yeah. think as long as the teams will uh that to me like you know people might disagree with this i don't really care as long as it's entertaining and saturday was uh, wonderfully entertaining and i think this particular matchup guarantees an entertaining final which is for, for me is the main thing yeah is that just uh, the game has gone so cohesive and team heavy now that if you're not playing as many games as you used to be which these teams aren't it's not going to be as cohesive or you know or as good that's yeah, probably it, I mean, isn't it yeah 100 you know, i i agree you know 100 percent that is uh the case and it also yeah. is the case that these teams don't the, the contact time is declined they don't you know you don't get switching time to road test you, you say for you know uh Kerry's inability to develop a plan b i would say if that if the if the quick ball what i mean by that is you know the, the ball to the inside line isn't on what do you do next i would say if Kerry had another couple of league games they probably would have road tested that and tried uh, a running game and whatever but they didn't have the opportunity to do that and as a result their attacking structure is you know the run down blind alleys and the usual stuff that that went wrong on saturday and but you know like like i said that, that issue weeks, that Morris, i don't think is five weeks we should have got on to shane mcgraw about some a versus b games <laughs> yeah, Liam, yeah. Liam Sheedy talking about p- uh, piping in the the noise into Semple Stadium for of, of the Kerry Dublin 2019 All Ireland Final so that the players wouldn't be you know there's lots of things they could have been in. now maybe they were obviously but I Kerry definitely seemed like they weren't fully at the races we've talked to Darren about that already but um, I don't know I'm looking forward to the final we'll hopefully as you said may- maybe in the two weeks uh, or maybe Mayo have been working on their cohesiveness in A versus B games for the last <laughs> couple of weeks but. Uh, We'll talk about it lots more before we get to it. Um, thanks a million for joining us, Morris. And lots of food for talk. People can read your piece on balls.ie, uh, which goes into more detail about the uh, about the TV coverage. Cheers, Mick. No worries. Um, thanks to Morris. Thanks a million to Darren, obviously, as well. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel if you like what you see. And, of course, if you're listening to the podcast also, if you're not already, please do subscribe. Please leave us a rating as well and a comment. It always really helps. We'll be back uh, with more GEA Embedded before the All-Ireland Final, um, which is now two weeks away. and It's the end of the inter-county GEA season.